right. So, Canto 3, Chapter 11, Text 39, and Text 40. Since uh, Text 39 has no purport, we'll just uh, skip doing it responsibly. I'll just read it, and then we can work verse 40 responsibly. Kaloyam pramanavadir dvi parardhanta ishvaraha niveshitum prabhur bhumna ishvaro dhamamaninam kaloyam paramanvadir dvi parardhanta ishvaraha niveshitum prabhur bhumna Ishvaro dhamamaninam. Eternal time is certainly the controller of different dimensions. From that of the atom up to the super divisions of the duration of Brahma's life. But nevertheless, it is controlled by the Supreme. Time can control only those who are body conscious, even up to the Satyalok, or the other higher planets of the universe. Eternal time is certainly the controller of different dimensions, from that of the atom up to the super divisions of the duration of Brahma's life. But nevertheless, it is controlled by the Supreme. Time can control only those who are body conscious, even up to the Satyalok, or the other higher planets of the universe. Okay, so this is text 3.11.40. Vikarai sahito yuktair. Vikarai sahito yuktair. Visheshad bhir avrita. Vishe shad dibhir avritaha. Anda ko sho bahir ayam. Anda ko sho bahir ayam. Panchasat koti vish tritaha. Panchasat koti vish tritaha. Vikarai sahito yuktair. Visheshad dibhir avrtaha. Anda ko sho bahir ayang. Panchasat koti vishtritaha. Vikarai sahito yukte Visheshad bhir avrita An kosho bahir ayam Panja shat koti vishtritaha Vikarai sahito yukte Visheshad bhir avrita Andako sho bahir ayam Panja shat koti vishtritaha Vikarai By the transformation of the elements Sahitaha along with yuktahai being so amalgamated viseshu manifestations adibihi by them avrtaha covered andakoshaha the universe bahihi outside ayam this 
Panchashat fifty Koti ten million Vishtrataha widespread. So the translation reads This phenomenal material world is expanded to a diameter of four billion miles as a combination of eight material elements transformed into 16 further categories within and without as follows. (coughs) So I say, and you please repeat, this phenomenal material world world is expanded to a diameter of four billion miles as a combination of eight material elements transformed into 16 further categories within and without as follows. Okay, so here's Prabhupada's purport. As explained before, the entire material world is a display of 16 divisions and 8 material, 16 diversities and 8 material elements. The analytical studies of the material world are the subject matter of Sankhya philosophy. The first 16 diversities are the 11 senses and 5 sense objects. And the 8 elements are the gross and subtle matter, namely earth, water, fire, air, sky, mind, intelligence, and ego. All these combined together are distributed throughout the entire universe, which extends diametrically to four billion miles. Besides this universe of our experience, there are innumerable other universes. Some of them are bigger than the present one, and all of them are clustered together under similar material elements as described below vikarai sahito yuktar visheshadi bhir avrtaha andakosho bahir ayang panchashat koti vishtritaha this phenomenal material world is expanded to a diameter of four billion miles as a combination of eight material elements transformed into 16 further categories within and without as follows. First I thought I'd say a little thing, something about the previous verse um, about eternal time. In these verses, in this chapter, we are discussing quite a great deal about the atom, the, the constituent nature of the material world that we live in, and we're also talking about divisions of time. So um, these are important ideas because it helps us to get a sense of where we are in a bigger picture. Um, If you want to know where you are and you're lost in a city, you know, the city of New York has now put up these various signs everywhere where you are here, you know, a big sort of photograph and maybe a few of the areas of New York are there within one borough and you can kind of see you're at the corner of this and that, like here we are at the corner of... uh, Nevins and Skimmerhorn, you know, uh, and you can see where that fits into Borum Hill, where that fits into um, downtown Brooklyn and, you know, further, further designations. And this gives us some sense of where we fit into the overall picture, not only from a locational point of view, but also from a temporal point of view, where we are time-wise. So... um, What's interesting here is this verse uh, really reminds me of, of course, verse from uh, Bhagavad Gita. Let 
Here we go. Sri Bhagavan Uvacha Kalos Kalos me loko kshaya krit pravido lokan samadhartum iha pravita rite pita rite pitwamna abhavashanti sarve ye vyashtita prata yani ke ye vashtita prat yani ke shuyoda. The Supreme Personality of God had said, Time I am, great destroyer of the worlds, and I have come here to destroy all people with the exception of you, the Pandavas. All soldiers here on both sides will be slain. So Krishna is telling this to Arjuna on the battlefield uh, that time is him. He is time. Of course, this is an aspect of him, an impersonal aspect of Krishna is the time factor. And this time factor will destroy everybody except for the Pandavas. And we know that after the Battle of Kurukshetra is finished, uh, all the soldiers on both sides are, in fact, slain except for the Pandavas and about four or five other people. They live through the Battle of Kurukshetra. Everyone else is killed. Uh, this verse was also quoted by Robert Oppenheimer <laughs> on the uh, momentous event of the explosion of the first atomic bomb. So uh, Robert Oppenheimer was interested in the Vedas, and so he read Bhagavad Gita. And there's even a, a, a video where Robert Oppenheimer is quoting this verse, you know, uh, talking later about the, how he helped develop the uh, atomic bomb, the first one that was um, um, exploded in the desert, you know, so the bomb went off, and then he thought of this verse, time I am destroyer of the world, so uh, the atomic bomb is certainly a very destructive um, uh, weapon. Of course, as uh, Krishna is saying, that uh, the uh, destructive potency of time has no effect on those who are in devotional service or those who are not in the body of consciousness. Because the body certainly will uh, demonstrate the effects of the progress of time. Uh, There's no way the body can endure forever. The body must eventually disintegrate and if one is identified with the body then one is in great distress as the body disintegrates and one feels uh, more and more lost in the material world. In the beginning when the body is young and we are full of energy and vigor uh, it seems like it's just a matter of time before we'll have everything that we want. Uh, all of our material desires seem uh, almost within grasp. But by the time we get old and infirm, then the ship has sailed, the cow has gone out of the barn at that time. At that point, uh, it doesn't look like there's any pot of gold or any rainbow. At, at that point, it doesn't look like our home on the hill, our place in the sun will happen, you know. Um, that uh, if it hasn't happened already, buddy, it ain't happening, you know. It's uh, not likely to happen. And of course, so this is why people greatly lament. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow. It is like a poor player who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is like a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. (laughs) So... um, this is actually what life seems like, you know, to uh, people who are um, uh, caught up in bodily identification. But we are not the body. We are simply within the body, which is a different thing. The body is an external arrangement of atoms, as we've been hearing about 
Um, it's interesting how all this works together. Um, I thought I'd take today to briefly kind of go over, you know, the six darshans um, because uh, they are a part of the whole Vedic picture we have. Uh, and, and actually, they kind of go in sequence. You have nyaya or logic, and then that's followed on by Vaisheshika, which is very, very similar to what we discussed in this chapter, the idea of atoms and how they work. And then we go to Sankhya, which Prabhupada mentions in the purport of uh, the verse uh, 31140. So Prabhupada touched on the notion of Sankhya. That's the third level. And then after Sankhya, we have the yoga systems. And after yoga, we have karma mimamsa philosophy. And then we have Vedanta darshan. So these are the six ones. And nyaya or logic basically teaches one how to form good arguments and to speak in a way that's concise and accurate. And then we move into Vaisheshika, which tells us about how this material world that we can be too attached to is ultimately made of atoms. And these atoms are not eternal. I mean, their configurations are not eternal. Vaisheshika does hold that the atoms are eternal. In a certain way, they are. You know, we know the material universe comes and goes, but the, uh, the forms made by the atoms are certainly not eternal. They come into a configuration and then they disappear. So that brings us to the third level, which is uh, Sankhya, which gives us a sense of how to distinguish between matter and spirit to a degree. We learn about uh, these 24 elements of Sankhya philosophy. And uh, that way we can kind of understand that we are not our bodies and that there's a mechanical arrangement of the material world. Then from that we go to yoga, which is for people who are more still locked into the material body. We have various physical exercises and breath activities that help us to detach from the body in a physical, mechanical way. So if we didn't get it philosophically, now we can do it through uh, physical uh, means. And then the fifth stage is um, the uh, uh, philosophy of Jaimini or uh, Karma Mimamsa, which teaches how karma works, which is um, um, actually something that's completely unknown for the most part in the Western world. You know, people do think about it, but they don't know any details about it. And finally, we have Vedanta Darshan, which teaches who God is and what our relationship with, is with him. So these are progressive stages. And they were all part of one, we could say, or call it a curriculum at one point or another. But as Kali Yuga came on, these different uh, six became disconnected from one another and actually appeared to be almost philosophies in and of themselves. They appeared to be separate and non-connected and even competitors with one another. And um, we find there's a nice book actually by uh, Suhotra where he describes in detail about the uh, six darshans. And he describes that, <coughs> that each one is associated with a particular sage, you know, like um, Nyaya is associated with Gotama and Vaisheshika with Kanrada, and then we have uh, Sankhya with uh, Kapila, and we have uh, Yoga with Patanjali, and then we have Karma Mimamsa with Jaimini, and finally Vedanta Darshan with Veda Vyas. So these are the uh, main proponents, and they pulled together the various teachings and you know, made a whole system. And these were like competing schools up to a certain point until about uh, 500 BC, or in other words, about 500 years before the advent of Jesus Christ. So um, at that time, um, Buddhism started to make its way onto the scene. And uh, 
with Buddhism to fight against, then these uh, different schools became even more entrenched. By, you know, the later part of that era, uh, the school of Jaimini or Karma Mimamsa became kind of the main guys. They pushed everybody else into the background and uh, they became the uh, most uh, important, uh, at least the most popular. And this Karma Mimamsa philosophy ushered in the way for large-scale animal slaughter. And because of this great horror that was being mostly proposed by the uh, Karma Mimamsa school, Buddhism uh, made its main focus as a himsa or nonviolence. So um, then by about 250 BC, that's when Emperor Ashok, um, uh, who was the emperor of India, at least a big portion of India at that time, embraced Buddhism. And so for many years, India uh, had not very much connection with the Vedas and instead followed Buddhism, primarily because uh, Buddha had come to set an end to this uh, animal slaughter that uh, the followers of Jaimini had uh, promoted. So then about the 7th century after uh, the birth of Jesus, then we have uh, Shankara Acharya, who puts the Vedas back into the picture. But he does it in a very Buddhistic way, so that people are not too jarred by changing from Buddhism to his version of uh, Vedic followers. And then we go on, you know. So um, this is kind of an overview of these uh, darshans, you know. Um, and uh, each one has something to teach us, and each one actually is connected with a theistic and with a um, personalistic understanding of the Supreme. But um, because of all the haggling and the advent of Kali Yuga, many uh, modern surviving explanations of these do not touch much on the Supreme Lord, if at all. So uh, the modern sort of ways that these are uh, described um, really don't help much. But they are a genuine part of Vedic philosophy and they do help one to understand kind of the mechanisms of how this world can be viewed. The same things that Western philosophy wrestled with for centuries and centuries and never got right. You know, and uh, still to this day, there are uh, big, big questions in Western philosophy that never really got answers. Uh, and if you look at the Vedic system, there are answers for these things. But um, Western philosophers just leave it as an open question. So it's an open question. You can believe like this or you can believe like that. Um, now... It's an interesting thing here that uh, this phenomenal material world is expanded to a diameter of four billion miles. Sadaputta talks about this, you know, this uh, figure. Uh, this may seem quite large that the uh, material universe is four billion miles in diameter, but, you know, in modern astronomical terms, that's kind of like the orbit of Uranus or something like that. That's about as big as that is, you know. So it's interesting that Prabhupada, um, in Chaitanya Charitamrita, let me go there, has this to say. In Madhya Leela 21. There it is, finally it comes up. 80, 84. And this, of course, um, is taken from the story of 
Krishna and Brahma when Krishna calls Brahma and uh, Brahma arrives in, um, you know, uh, Krishna's uh, domain. And uh, when the gatekeeper asks uh, who is there, Brahma says, it's Lord Brahma, tell Krishna Lord Brahma is here to see him. And uh, the gatekeeper responds to Brahma, Krishna wants to know which Brahma. And Brahma's a little puzzled by that. You know, he's uh, I, as far as I know, I'm the only Brahma. And so when he goes to actually get darshan of Krishna, Brahma says, my dear Lord, you are supreme. Uh, but why did you ask me which Brahma? I thought that there was only one Brahma in each universe. And by way of reply, Krishna summons all the Brahmas uh, from various universes. And Lord Brahma sees that some have 10 heads, some have 100 heads, some have a thousand heads, some have a million heads. And so <laughs> Brahma only has four. So um, he's a little bit, uh, of course, he's humbled by this. Uh, and uh, then uh, this is a dialogue. And so uh, the dialogue says here in this is uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Leela. Uh, 2184.21.84 Krishna kahe abramanda panchasat koti yojan ati kshudra tate toma rachari vadana Krishna said your particular universe has a diameter of 4 billion miles this is where this is coming from has a diameter of 4 therefore it is the smallest of all the universes consequently you have only Four heads. So, in the purport, this is Prabhupada's purport, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati Thakur, one of the greatest astrologers of his time, gives the information from the Siddhanta Shiromani that this universe measures 18 quadrillion, 712 trillion, 69 billion, 200 million times eight miles. <laughs> So uh, this is the circumference of this universe. According to some, this is only half the circumference. So um, this is a different figure, (laughs) by the way. Um, This figure uh, that Prabhupada quotes in this verse uh, boils out to um, something like uh, 40... Seven or forty-eight uh, uh, quadrillion miles as a diameter, because we're talking about the circumference here. So this is the circumference. So you have to multiply this eighteen point seven quadrillion number by eight to make it miles from Yojanas, and divide it by three point one four one six, you know, or one seven, whatever it is for pi. And then you wind up with uh, something that's quite a much larger figure. And if you divide that by 5.88 trillion miles per light year, then it boils out to something like um, 8,000 light years. Um, at least that's the figure I got. Sadaputi gets a figure closer to about 5,000 light years, but he makes some adjustments in there for something I don't know exactly what. So this is a more, a larger figure by quite some uh, measure. So what are we to make about this? Um, well, it appears that um, measurements can be done in different ways, and it also appears that measurements may mean different things according to exactly what you're talking about. So partly it's semantic and partly it's methodological, you know, that uh, these things uh, are measured in somewhat different ways. And uh, when we mean the, the width or the diameter of the universe exactly at what point, we know the universe has shells. And these are described also that there's a shell of, you know, uh, 
earth, then there's a shell of uh, water, then there's a shell of fire, then there's a shell of air, and then there's a shell of ether, etc., etc. It goes on out. So, um, and each one of these shells is ten times more uh, extensive than the previous shell. So we're kind of like, you know, powers of ten down into a little bead in the center of a large ball or something like that, the very center. So what are we measuring to? Uh, all those questions are there. And Sariputta discusses some of those issues that uh, we're not clear exactly at what point we're measuring out to. <coughs> and... Um, when we talk about the Western astronomical numbers, um, we have to recognize that probably of the sciences, um, astronomy is one of the more speculative ones. It's definitely, um, how do we know that Alpha Centauri is 4.2 light years from us or something thereabouts, you know? How do they know that? You know, um, I don't think Lowe's has tape measures that go quite that far. So um, how, how do they figure it out? Um, obviously, the way they do it is based on theories. And if the theories are wrong, so is the measurement. You know, um, at one point in the history of uh, cosmology, uh, we had a universe that was Earth-centered, and it wasn't very big. Uh, during the time of Aristotle, certainly there was this kind of Earth-centric and kind of s sort of smallish universe, you know. But um, what happened was that with Galileo challenging the idea that the Earth was at the center. By the way, it doesn't matter. You can put the Earth at the center, you can put the Sun at the center, or you can put Pluto at the center, whatever you want at the center, because... Uh, Mathematics works the same way. It's just easier for certain kinds of computations if you put the uh, sun at the center, if you're doing travel from one planet to another. But if you're doing travel around the Earth, it's easier to put the Earth at the center. So uh, as with any Cartesian system, you can put the center anywhere you like. But at uh, any rate, um, with the idea of putting the sun at the center, then there was this idea of triangulating where these stars actually are, how far they are away. So they figured at one time of the year, they would measure what the angle was, and then at the opposite time of the year, because supposedly then the Earth is on the other side of the sun, they would measure what the angle was to that same star uh, six months later. And then they would take those two angles and see what the difference was, the parallax, as it's called. Um, and what happened was there wasn't any. <laughs> you know? Or it was so small that they couldn't measure it hardly. You know? So um, what are we to make of this? Well, either Earth is at the actual center of the universe and there isn't any parallax, or the... Um, uh, idea is that these things must be so far away, so very, 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 very far away that the parallax, even with the Earth, you know, uh, you know, what is it? We're 90, 93 million miles away. So if the Earth is on one side in one part and on the other side in another part, that must mean 180 million miles difference. So if 180 million miles don't make enough difference in the parallax, and these stars must be super way out there. And that's when the idea that the universe was much bigger than thought before started to creep in. Now, how do they figure out these exact distances, you know, when the parallax doesn't do it? Uh, well, they make assumptions. They make assumptions about the, uh, you know, how fast light goes and uh, that there's this Doppler effect that if uh, something is reddish, <coughs> right, that means that uh, it's moving away from us. If it's bluish, it's coming towards us. <coughs> Just as if you hear a, um, 
car going by you with the horn be- beeping, you know, it's going, ma as the pitch goes down, because as it's coming towards you, it's pushing the sound uh, frequencies closer together and it's going away from you, they're being pulled apart. So there's apparent drop in pitch. So this happens with light too, at least apparently. And still this doesn't tell you how far away something is. When they say the moon is a certain distance, they can actually shoot a laser beam to the moon and watch and wait for it to come back, you know. Uh, But with anything outside of our solar system, forget that. It doesn't work. So they have this idea of certain stars or certain sizes... And if there's certain sizes, if we see a star at a certain place, then we know that it must be a certain size, therefore it must be a certain brightness. If it's a certain brightness, that means it must be X distance. You can see this is all speculative math, you know. Um, uh, if, if the math isn't right, then all these distances are way off, you know. And we suspect it is, you know. Sadaputa mentions the... Um, uh, scientific findings of Halton Arp. You know, you have supposedly these uh, galaxies with uh, kind of like a spiral. And the galaxy is supposed to be a certain distance. But on the edge of the galaxy, on the spiral arm, there's a, a star. And according to the modern estimation, that one star is either way farther away, uh, according to its Um, Doppler measurement than it should be because it should be part of the galaxy that's right next to and it looks like a part of that galaxy but uh, the measurement for it is wrong you know so these uh, measurements by the scientists are not by any means solid and they could change at any time So um, we can't take these things absolutely verbatim or as as gospel, you know, that uh, the scientists themselves are adjusting them. And they're based on various kinds of guesswork, basically, various kinds of theories. If the theories are wrong, then so is the figure, you know. Um, And we don't have any independent way to do it. We aren't like Star Trek. We can't get in the uh, Enterprise and, you know, get Scotty to pump it up to warp factor nine or whatever, go out there and come back and figure out how long it took us to get there. You know, we can't do that kind of thing. So everything that we know about the universe, especially the cosmos that we see, (coughs) we have to bracket with some degree of um, speculation, you know, as some degree of speculation. So um, unfortunately, that's the way the material world is that uh, we have what we know and we have what we don't know. So these are kind of mixed. And everywhere you look, there's something we know, something we don't know. Mark Twain once said that um, it isn't what you don't know that gets you. It's what you know that ain't so. (laughs) So uh, not only do we have what we know and what we don't know, we have what we think we know but ain't so. So that's in the mix as well. And um, as far as what we see from the devotional uh, literatures, we also don't have the full picture because the full picture is impossible. There's too much. So Krishna and the Vedic literatures only give us a little bit of how the universe is, uh, you know, arranged. They don't give us all the details. Uh, we might want them, but uh, because the scientists are thinking, well, what have you got to say? So we only get so much. And uh, so our picture is not complete. Their picture is not complete. Uh, but at least in the Vedic picture, the fundamentals, the basics on which we base things are not changing. Our uh, basic uh, siddhanta is there. Whereas in the scientific picture, everything is changing. Their figures, their conclusions, and even the stuff that they believe is fundamental, even that is changing. So anything could go on there, you know. Uh, And that's why the scientific picture never gives us any kind of clear, definitive answers to anything. 
Except if they're arguing with someone who's from a the- theistic point of view where they argue that everything they say is absolutely true and everything that people from a religious point of view say is m- mythology. So, All right, so um, let's, uh, uh, I'm going to ask to see if there's any questions or comments and then we'll wrap up today's uh, class here. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Maharaj, for the class. I am thinking sometimes it's a little bit confusing that To some extent, we see that the modern science reached some results because it reached some result, good right, result. Right. Because in some areas, we see they uh, they are doing good job. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, some some of the technologies, like for example, if you go on the plane, and they know exactly how much time it will take you to go to other side of the right, earth. Right. That means they have quite correct measurements. Even, JFK to LAX, right? <laughs> yeah. Even sometimes they are saying the pilot it's not really almost doing anything. Just the whole machine is making the calculations, gives you the, the speed, everything. But from other perspective we see that it will go a little bit further. It's kind of obvious that everything is one big speculation. So this is a little bit confusing. If you go a little further, what? If you go a little bit further into the universe, right. it's obvious that they cannot really figure out everything right, because right. we are very small. So this is a little bit confusing. As a devotee, from one side it looks like that the, the, the science has very particular knowledge, very correct knowledge and very functional knowledge, at the same time it doesn't look like that at all. Right, right. right. Can you comment on this one? Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's what I'm saying, that uh, we have what we, what we know and then what we don't know. And for my realization, the farther you get away from the here, the now, and what you can control, the more speculative our understanding of that thing is. You know, the farther away it is, the less we really know about it. The more we can't control it, the less we know about it. You know, uh, the longer ago it happened, or the future where it was supposed to happen, the uh, farther we get away, the less we know about something. So, what science does well with is things we can control, things that are here, and things that are now. You know, so when uh, scientists make some experiment in a beaker, you know, that's here. It's now. Uh, and they can control. So therefore, you can get fairly solid results, you know. But um, when we're talking about what happened thousands of years ago, uh, or when we're talking about what will happen thousands of years from now, you can't help but recognize there must be a lot of guesswork involved in that. And similarly, you know, when you get away from things we can control, then the less we can control it, the less we can say about it, like uh, meteorology, the weather, you know. What I really like is uh, the famous statement that tomorrow there's 50% chance of rain. I really love that one because it sounds so scientific. But what it really means is that we don't know and we're not even going to guess. (laughs) <laughs> because if you say 50% chance of rain, tomorrow it rains, they say, well, we thought there was a half a chance that it would rain. And if it doesn't rain, they'll say the same thing. <laughs> so um, what kind of a statement is that? It's a statement of nothing. You know, it's a statement that essentially has no essence to it, you know. Um, and this is kind of the way things are, you know, that there is a probabilistic Uh, aspect to the statements that science makes you know Uh, if you can control it 
you know enough about it to eliminate a lot of external um, interferences, then you can say this is going to happen, especially if it's just a few minutes from now or whatever it is, and you can control everything, and it's right here in front of you. But when you start making predictions about things, when you start talking about what's going on light years from here, or what went on thousands of years ago, then it's very speculative. And some things are just so full of chaos that we don't know anything about that we can't make any statements about them. Like uh, the weather, for one. Of course, biology is full of stuff like that. You know, we do know some things about biology. But there's so many complex uh, things going on that um, we can't make any long-term predictions about it. You know, it's, uh, there's so many things out of our control, so many factors at play that we get lost in that maze of different um, effects and causes, you know. So science is the study of effects and causes, you know. Um, and if we can't line up a cause and its effect, and we're not sure that the cause always causes that same effect, uh, or maybe other things can cause that same effect, then it's hard to call that science. You know, it's hard to um, really uh, understand that those things are connected. And so, at any rate, this just shows that science is based on certain assumptions, and those assumptions can't be proved, but if you accept those assumptions, then you can build science up from it. Uh, but even those assumptions can sometimes be changed in science. This was one of the things that a lecture I was listening to by um, Vrindavan Priya from, um, you know, uh, Vaisheshika's group, you know, was uh, giving. He was talking about how in science even the foundational things change sometimes. But in the Vedic literature, the foundations never change. Um, um, and therefore... Uh, we may not have the complete picture, but at least we have the bottom line picture. And uh, we also can deal with what the purpose of things is. Science has nothing to say about the purpose of things, nor how well the uh, scientific explanation gives us a sense of uh, connection or uh, or. or place in the grand scheme of things. In fact, uh, with the scientific picture, we are kind of at, we find ourselves in an existential black hole, not knowing why we're here, where we're going, what we should be doing. But the Vedas explain why we're here, why this place is as squirrely as it is, and uh, what to do to get out. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Yes. I read something that um, the, 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 on the map of the science that gives us everything exists besides us. We are not there, so right, we right. are lost. We, we don't know. <laughs> um, I just wanted to mention about uh, the, the Sadarshanas that um, uh, it's very interesting how um, in the Vedic. Um, uh, context, all these six schools, they have, as you mentioned, Maharaj, they have certain contributions, and everybody, all, all others, they accept those certain, those particular um, good things that they have to offer. For example, the Nyaya, they, we also accept um, Panchanga Nyaya, this is developed by them. Uh, and um, Vaisheshika, we also accept that there are atoms. In the Bhagavatam, there is a description. And Sankhya, we have. We agree with, with the Sankhya, uh, the evolution of Prakriti, we have our Right, own. there's two kinds of Sankhya. There's yeah. the atheist Kapila, and yeah. there's the, what we'll be studying in the fourth canto. That's yeah. a different Kapila. And everybody's doing some type of yoga also. What's that? Everybody's doing some type of yoga. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, And uh, Karma Yumamsa, we, um, we accept this. Um, they're famous with their theory of... Uh, uh, hermeneutics, how to interpret the scripture. They have this um, um, 
Tat Paryalingas, which are the six, six, um, six things you have to look in the text uh, in order to understand the meaning, the beginning, the end, what is um, the new thing that is uh, introduced, what is glorified, etc. So we all accept this, the Jiva Goswami accept this. So, and in Vedanta also, even with the impersonalists, we are agreeable to a certain level. We, uh, um, we agree that this material world is... Uh, not not good place. We are, we are not from here. We are spiritual mm -hmm. souls. So it's interesting that in the very context, it has this coherent picture of reality, and more or less everybody agrees on certain assumptions. Whereas in the West, it's all uh, chaotic and they're all fighting uh, and different schools. They, they don't they disagree with. There well, no it's, it's interesting that when you take Krishna out of the picture, the entirety of philosophy falls mm -hmm. apart. You know, because Krishna is ultimately the the thread, as he says in Bhagavad Gita, that um, you know, I'm everything is is strung upon me like pearls are strung upon a thread. You know, so if you take the thread out, the pearls all fall. And this is a, kind of a short explanation of the whole history of modern Western philosophy that. Uh, they just went down one rabbit hole after another, and uh, they essentially never came out of the rabbit hole. They just still have, you know, th what they did was they came out of the rabbit hole, so, well, you can go there, you can go there, you can go there, but no idea of which of those is actually the best way or the correct way, you know, so it's all like that, everything. Um, you can talk about philosophy as long as you're happy with kind of a sloppiness, you know, that it, it, the minute you want to talk about anything philosophical and you want to get down to something exact, you go down a rabbit hole of some kind or another and you never come out of it, you know, you come up with it. And the history of Western philosophy is people going down those rabbit holes, you know. Um, do we really see the world out there or we're seeing something else? Is there something besides consciousness? Does consciousness actually exist? Um, are there fundamental qualities uh, and are there uh, secondary qualities, some that never change and some qualities that are, uh, you know, um, some that are objective and some that are subjective, you know? Um, uh, is uh, knowledge real? You know, uh, or is it just narratives? You know, there are all these different, <laughs> you know, each one of these things are uh, rabbit holes in themselves. You had something you were going to say? No. Okay, so uh, thank you all very much for your kind attention. All glories to Sriman Bhagavatam, all glories to Vaishnav devotees of the Lord. Hare Krishna. <laughs>